Our next speaker is Todd Coleman. Bio, bioengineering professor Todd Coleman will discuss a new technology developed in collaboration with colleagues in the Neurointegration Laboratory, a wireless sensor embedded in a temporary tattoo that can pick up relevant information from the human body, allowing wireless monitoring of vital signs and brain signals useful in a wide range of applications. Professor Coleman will demonstrate a few of the seemingly endless possibilities of this emerging technology. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I thought perhaps the best way to sort of explain uh, what I do is uh, by, telling, uh, by telling a story. And so uh, what you'll see tonight is a, is a story uh, which starts with, um, <clears throat> which starts with a, a friend of mine I went to college with and his wife, uh, so here's my, wife, my friend Fareed and his wife uh, Rana, and here, uh, here they are and she's pregnant and Fareed sort of grew a, a beer belly to sort of empathize with her throughout the process of being pregnant and everybody's happy and everybody's joyous as they're awaiting, uh, awaiting their two twins, actually. And so, uh, but next what we see is perhaps not so uh, happy of a picture. And so here is Rana at about 24 weeks. And it turns out that, as you know, being pregnant with twins, uh, typically they're born, uh, born prematurely. And uh, at uh, 24 weeks, she was beginning to have uh, serious uterine contractions. And so she had to go to the hospital and be on bed rest uh, for 10 days and it was, uh, a very uh, worrying sign because, as you know, if a baby was born that early, there'd be all sorts of uh, crazy problems. Uh, what you also notice about this picture is that Rana is very uncomfortable, and that's in part because of this clunky technology and these belts that have these sensors on them. It's difficult for her to move around, as some of the moms here know, particularly trying to monitor the, the fetal heart rate becomes a big pain. And moreover, uh, when Rana went back home after she was um, uh, uh, on bed rest for 10 days at the hospital, uh, she was worried in, in, on many occasions because there's not too many technologies that can monitor the status of the fetus to understand if it's under distress or to understand what's going on with heart rate or other sorts of issues. And so uh, what my research uh, group sort of was taking a look at more generally was trying to understand why is it the case that it's very difficult for us to have a ubiquitous uh, sort of, uh, you know, health monitoring technologies. And the reason is in fact pretty, uh, pretty uh, there's a serious contrast. On the one hand, we have biology, which is a sort of soft, uh, curvy, linear, and elastic, whereas on the flip side, the building blocks of uh, electronics and sensors are semiconductor wafers, uh, and they're, they're sort of flat, rigid, and planar, right? And so speaking of politics, this is like Democrats and Republicans, right? <laughs> so <laughs> food for fodder for discussion afterwards. So. Uh, uh, so, so you might ask yourself, okay, well, how can I get around this problem? And it turns out one way that you can get across uh, uh, this problem is uh, by taking a semiconductor wafer uh, that's doped with all the circuits and whatnot on it and peeling off a very, very thin layer. And it turns out if you peel off anything and make it thin enough, it becomes bendable and flexible, including silicon. So you can take off a very, very thin layer of silicon with the right type of procedure and then mount it onto something that naturally sort of integrates with biology like a piece of band-aid material, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then what you can accomplish are uh, flexible electronics. So um, with that, uh, myself and my collaborators, including John Rogers at the University of Illinois, we embarked upon uh, trying to see if we could put sensors and integrate them with the skin that can naturally bend with the skin while still acquiring bo uh, bodily signals of interest. And so what we were able to accomplish uh, in a paper that we published about a year ago in science is uh, what we call uh, epidermal electronics. And so what you see in this picture right here in the background is the skin, and in the foreground you see this sort of electronic circuit type of material, but notice that it naturally compresses and stretches with the skin. Okay, and so moreover, uh, the title of my talk is Tattoo Electronics. Well, it turns out that that little sort of elastomer, that flexible material, you can make that flexible material a temporary tattoo. And so what you see right here is a temporary tattoo, the school where I used to be, uh, Illinois. And uh, underneath here, you see, here's are the electronics that have been integrated with the tattoo. And after I mount this onto the skin, the technology is now completely concealed from the observer. And moreover, it's also concealed to the user because it bends naturally with the skin. 
So we now develop completely invisible technology. And so you might ask yourself, well, what can we sort of uh, monitor with this? Well, we can monitor a variety of things, okay? We can, um, first of all, there's a wireless antenna on here, so we can wirelessly transmit. There, we can sort of wirelessly transmit, uh, transfer power to the device. Uh, you can mount LEDs on here, light emitting devices. Moreover, you can put light sensing devices on here, so you can pick up uh, information about blood oxygenation. Uh, we can pick up temperature, mechanical strain, and also a variety of electrical signals on the surface of the body. And so as this relates to Rana and her pregnancy, uh, what we've demonstrated is that we can pick up signals reflective of sort of muscle movements, which would be important for uterine contractions. We can pick up uh, the, the EKG signal, which is important for not only Rana's heartbeat, but the baby's, uh, the baby's heart rate. And moreover, what we show uh, in this unpublished work is that uh, what you see in this red picture here is the original uh, EKG signal, and this blue one is what we wirelessly transmitted. So we have a complete wireless solution that we're building. So the high level idea at this point that we have is that we could take this original picture of Rana where she was very uncomfortable and replace it with a picture that looks like this. And so this could make uh, her time in the hospital that much more enjoyable, but moreover, we could also allow her when she's back at home and uncomfortable to understand a little more about the status of the fetus. Okay, so this is a collaboration with Sandy Ramos here at UCSD, and uh, we've uh, also won a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation project to advance the epidemiology of preterm birth. So um, if we stand back and take a look at uh, their two sons now, so here we have uh, Nikon and Ideen, and everyone is happy and smiling and whatnot, but as I mentioned before, it's quite common when you have twins that they're born prematurely. So the typical picture that you see when babies are born prematurely is something that looks like this, and uh, what many of you might sort of think about, when you think about premature babies, you think about the fact that perhaps the heart is not completely well developed and the lungs are not completely well developed. But it turns out that in terms of the ICU, those two issues have been uh, uh, addressed quite well. But it turns out that the key bottleneck right now with dealing with premature babies is dealing with their brains. And it turns out that it's quite common that because the vasculature is not completely well developed, that they can suffer from strokes. And moreover, they can have seizures. And what's difficult about the seizures is the fact that it's not like in an adult where you can see from their behavior that they're having seizures. Rather, with these, uh, with these babies, there's absolutely no, no behavioral response that you can see. So as a consequence, it's quite common that they have to monitor uh, with these brainwave EEG uh, sensors on these babies' brains. But here's one of the problems. So one of the problems is that they need a certified technician in the hospital to scrub the baby's skin, apply the conductive gel, put the electrodes on the head and check the electrical characteristics. And guess what? Uh, these people work Monday through Friday, eight to five. So imagine what happens if a baby is seizing at midnight or on Saturday. So this creates a big problem. And so this led to our interest in seeing if our technology could be used to monitor you know, electrical rhythms of the brain. And so what you see in this picture right here is uh, myself. And what you see on the left hemisphere, <laughs> right? uh, just freshly shaven, bald head, right? <laughs> so. Uh, what you see on the left hemisphere is the, the EEG sensors as they're typically applied. So you have to apply conductive gel, put the paste, monitor the impedance, et cetera, et cetera. And on the right hemisphere, you see our epidermal electronics. And these things you literally just mount onto the skin. Okay? And so what you see in this picture right here, the top four waveforms represent what was picked up from the less left hemisphere using standard EEG. And the bottom uh, four uh, waveforms represent what we were picking up with our epidermal electronic systems. And at a high level, what you see is that there's no difference. And in fact, we uh, blinded this data and gave it to a certified neurologist at the Children's Hospital, and he couldn't differentiate one from another. And so this is joint work with uh, Mary J. Harbert, who's actually in the audience, and uh, she's the director of neonatal neurology, and we're very excited about this project to advance the needs of premature babies. And so <clears throat> if we stand back and take a look at where we were, what this means is that we could perhaps replace this picture uh, in the ICU with a picture that looks something like this. And this has the added benefit of, again, not only being of utility in the hospital, but perhaps also when the baby is at home, if we think about sudden infant death syndrome and whatnot. But moreover, there's another added benefit in that now this could facilitate the mother having skin-to-skin -skin contact with the baby while still monitoring their vital signs. And so now perhaps what I can do along with this story from conception to birth is now perhaps we can sort of walk along and begin to imagine how these tattoos might be a part of Nikon and Idine's life. And so uh, another project that we've been uh, developing uh, very recently 
is uh, we've been uh, trying to understand if we can, just with our little tattoo electronics, imagine if you could just mount a temporary tattoo right on your forehead, and I could pick up electrical signals that are reflective of not just whether or not you're seizing, but rather of cognitive processes in your brain. Okay, and so what you see in this picture right here is imagine that, imagine that there's a, and this is quite common with the data deluge, what we have right now, we're always inundated with data, and in many situations, the first thing that we want to do is we just want to triage. What's important and what's not important? Or at least what do I know is not important, and then perhaps I can investigate the rest later. So we designed a paradigm where you have a, a variety of things that are unimportant, which we call distractors, and a couple of these images that have faces in them are quote unquote targets. And so it's well known that if you have a full cap of EEG with the gel and whatnot, that you can differentiate one from another just by monitoring the brain signals as you flash these images in front of them. And so what we were able to do is using sort of electromagnetics, cognitive neuroscience, and signal processing is we designed an electrode system, as you see right here, just on the forehead. And this is a signal that we picked up just from our electrode. And this is not average across many people. This is on an individual subject level where the black waveform represents something that's irrelevant to you, whereas the red signal represents something that's of an aha moment. And so we can robustly pick this up on individual subjects of statistical significance. And so we might ask ourselves, now that we can pick up brain signals reflective of cognition in a manner that's basically invisible to you, what types of applications could this create for Nikon and Ideen? And so one of the things that we did, we we're very fortunate to get connected to some people in the Hollywood industry, and there's a company called Living Pictures who uh, have a very, very interesting technology. And they basically, in real time, render sort of Hollywood quality uh, animation. But the beauty about this animation is that there's actually an actor behind the scenes and there's a camera looking at you as you interact with the character and it's saying you know hey you with the glasses on look over my way or why are you bored or why are you not doing this and they're engaging you and it's unbelievably realistic and if you've been to the san diego zoo with your kids you might have seen this because it's on display there and it's unbelievable how uh, how how much attention this attracts from the children so we had the idea of trying to partner with these folks and imagine if we could so here's nikon here with some of the little tattoos on his forehead and imagine if we could sort of uh, take children uh, as they're interacting with these characters and in a very subtle manner without the kids even learn it, basically test certain things about their learning and uh, apply images or, or auditory signals at the right point in time and by carefully tracking the time and whatnot and by monitoring their brain signals, what if we could differentiate the extent to which they're learning certain things? So this is a very, uh, very preliminary project, but we're very excited about these types of capabilities that this technology might enable. And so if we stand back and take a look at Nikon and Ideen as they age more so and more so, uh, we can begin to imagine how this technology could uh, be useful to them as they age. And so imagine if in the future, if one of them is sort of running with their dog and this sensor is uh, transmitting these signals wirelessly to their smartphone, it, it can identify that they're having a heart arrhythmia or they're about to have a heart attack, and this could directly signal the information to the ambulance. And as the ambulance is coming to get them, it can be sending the, the vital, si vital signs to them and also to their doctor who's waiting on them as they arrive at the hospital. <laughs> so, this is, uh, the, 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 and so this is in collaboration with many clinicians at Cal IT and the Telemedicine Center. We're really trying to turn the science fiction into reality. So the punchline uh, from all of this, as you see, is that we're trying to tell this story about how this can be a part of, uh, of, of Nikon and Ideen's lives as they grow. And what we're excited about is that this has implications from both the beginning of life to the end. And I think the, all the other possible applications are sort of uh, only limited by our creativity and our imagination. <coughs> so, thank you. <laughs> 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 And, and lastly, of course, I couldn't do this with all the students and, and postdocs in our laboratory. So thank you. <laughs>